All right, so to everyone here and watching at home, uh, we're happy to welcome uh, Matt Young, who will tell us about the bullet problem with discrete speeds. So th th thanks for having me, and I'm, I'm happy to get to talk about this problem here. I feel like it has more significance in this building than in like other places. And let me start with just a little bit of background about this. So the history of the bullet problem is a little murky, but it definitely origi originates from annihilating systems. And the sort of classical result for annihilating systems comes from, it was actually introduced by Erdős and Ney in 74, but the following theorem of Aradia sort of wraps it up. So in, in 81, he looked at what's called annihilating random walk on ZD. And I'll just say in words what it is. So essentially, at each vertex of ZD, you place a random walk. And they do continuous time random walks. And if any two particles collide, then they annihilate. They're removed from the graph. And the basic question you might ask about this on a transient graph like Z3 or higher is, is the origin visited infinitely often? And that's what this paper looked at. And indeed, it is. So it is recurrent almost surely for all D. And what's interesting about annihilating systems is it seems like as you start decreasing the amount of randomness in them, they get harder and harder to analyze. So consider the, the following question, which was communicated to me from uh, from Atai Benjamini, I'm not sure where it originates, but essentially what you look at is instead of doing a random walk, what if we change the path measure and make it slightly more deterministic? And what I mean by that is let's look at non-backtracking random walks instead of simple random walk. So it's actually still an open question to show that when the walks are non-backtracking, that this process, which is just a fairly harmless modification, to prove that this is recurrent. So in the context of the first theorem, you were mentioning this uh, Kirsten and Vandenberg theorem, which says how the density decays in time. Um, yeah, so. The, a, a really closely related process, instead of annihilating random walk, is coalescing random walk, where if you can think of it like when two particles collide, exactly one of them is destroyed, and then the other one gets to continue. And yeah, Keston and Vandenberg showed the occupation probability of the root behaves like basically like a constant over t. Also for annihilating. Hmm? Also for annihilating. And in annihilating random walk, it's that same occupation probability times a half. Is that's what, and that's proven in Aradia. I believe so. So, so in D equals two, it is non, not different? Um, the second, the no, I think you could probably prove that it is true in D oh. equals two, just since but a single it, particle it's is. It's also open? Um, yeah, or I'm not, I don't know. In D equals two, it's, oh, it's known. D equals two, I don't know if there's a paper about it, but it, it seems like a soft argument might give you that it's recurrent. Although, think, just standing here thinking, it's not clear to me if that's true or not. But certainly, you could restate the open problem as exhibit a transient graph on which non-backtracking annihilating random walks are recurrent. And essentially, what this has led to over time is looking at even more deterministic systems than just non-backtracking random walk. So there's this process that I believe this also ties back to Itai Benjamini, known as the meteor, meteor model. And what you do is you put down radius R balls according to a unit Poisson point process. So let's just look at this. You can do this in any dimension, but let's say we do it in R2. 
And to each one of these, you assign a random direction. So give them a direction uniformly in 0, 2 pi. And this is all the randomness present in the model. And from here on out, it's deterministic. And what you do is you have meteors follow the direction that they've chosen, and they move at rate 1. Or not, not even rate 1, at deterministic speed 1. So it's, there's nothing, nothing random about their motion. And they collide upon, if they collide, then they annihilate, they mutually annihilate. And I think what's kind of fascinating about uh, systems like this, which I'll refer to as an annihilating ballistic system, is that like, some of the most basic things you'd want to know are still open, and we don't really have an approach to prove them. So I think or how, how Atai described like, the question attached to, the, to this problem is, is the Earth almost surely struck by a meteor? Is like where this gains the meteor problem? But the, or the meteor model, but the, the open question is, is zero occupied almost surely? So there definitely, you can, if you, if you go out, there's this, there's infinitely many meteors that would point at the origin and strike it, but the question is, does the interference from meteors between them cause interference that prevents this from happening? And the, definitely the conjecture is that yes, the origin is struck almost surely, but what becomes different, difficult about these models where we have these deterministic paths going on is that once you condition on an event happening, that tells you global information about like, much of the model. And so it's very hard to find any renewal structure or self-similarities in these processes. And there's tons of spin-offs of this. There's all sorts of questions where if you just put non-backtracking or have these deterministic paths and annihilation, that you can't prove anything about them. Or, or I don't, I don't want to say can't, but there's a lot that's so, still open. And that's where the bullet process comes in. This is perhaps the simplest of all of these. I think argu arguably it is the simplest of all of them. And the origins of this are very unclear. I don't know who to credit for it, but Possibly it's a David Wilson who works at IBM is like one person who's been credited, but I'm not sure who, do you know who this? That's what I heard, but I don't know who this is. I mean, that's what I heard from Peter Winkler, who I learned the problem for. I learned it in 2012, mm -hmm. but uh, I need credit. Like some, some David Wilson, Wilson yeah. And, you know, David Wilson, but not our David Wilson. Yeah, not, not the Microsoft David Wilson, but. Um, yeah, I haven't uh, fully it down. No, no I, I tried to and was unable to fully pin this down, but the, the process is easy to define. Like that, that this has been pinned down. So the, the bullet process is um, defined as follows. So essentially, it takes place on the positive reals. And I like to draw it as a sort of old timesy canon. And what it's doing is it's firing a bullet every single second. So from the origin, you fire a bullet each second. And because I'll be referring to them throughout this talk, you're going to fire the ith bullet, which I'll call bi. So it's discrete time firings, and I'm going to refer to the ith bullet fired as bi. And each bullet is going to have independent or IID speeds sampled in some fashion. So we'll say that ha they have speed si. The example to keep in mind, which I'll mention in just a second, is say uniform 0, 1 speeds. And just like in all these other annihilating systems, 
collisions result in mutual annihilation. And so th this is the bullet process. And since, since you just walked in, bas basically the, the process that I'm talking about is you have a gun at the origin, and it fires a bullet every second, each with random speed. And if two bullets collide, they annihilate. And that's the whole process, yeah. You're familiar with it? So there's a variety of questions you could ask about it. But the one that has gained the most interest is related to the survival of the very first bullet that we fire. So just a little extra notation. I'm going to let bi maps to bj denote annihilation. And so with this, I'm going to let tau be the index, such that it destroys the very first bullet. So this is a random variable here. It's whatever bullet catches the very first fired bullet. And we'll say that b1 survives and otherwise it perishes. So it's a reasonable question to, or seeing survival is reasonable because possibly the interference behind it causes it to get further and further away and then that compounds and the bullet escapes. And this has been looked at and worked on by quite a few people and it's the following, I guess, conjecture. That there's a phase transition in the speed of the first bullet for survival and perishing. So I'm, I'm not sure who to attribute this conjecture to. Is it? Nazarov. Nazarov? OK. And putting it more explicitly, it's that there exists S star. Or based on system simulations. Oh, OK. That, that makes sense then. So. So if the SI are uniform 0, 1 random variables, which is, so or I, I didn't say I was acting like there can be any speed distribution. In the canonical bullet process, they are uniform 0, 1 speeds. So if the SI are uniform 0, 1s and independent, then there's some value S star. Such that if the first bullet is slower, is faster than S star, we see survival. This conjecture? That's the main one. I mean, it may okay, it's not, there's no reduction. But some the intuition is that should be the hardest. The, that uniform should be the hardest? Is that the intuition? It's probably just the most natural yes, thing to look at. That's fine. Yeah, because. Yeah, I'm, well, and I'm, so this talk is not going to look at uniform speeds, so I hope there are other variants you might consider. And moreover, the simulations, I'm told, suggest that this value S star is around 0.9. So S star is, put it in the wrong spot, it's just is a, basically the critical speed for survival. So there's, there's this window of the initial speed. So if your first bullet is slower and if it's faster, you have a positive probability of surviving. 
one, one versus positive. Zero versus positive. Yep, so yeah, just positive. Because there's of course there's always a chance the next bullet is going to catch you. Um so pretty pretty clear problem, I hope, and conjecture. And a lot of people have worked on this question like in various amounts, and I think almost no progress has been made on this. And also to my knowledge, or I guess a little more history, this problem basically just exists in various places on the internet too. Like it's stated on the IBM problem of the month page. And except in a different form slightly where they look at a finite problem. They ask if you fire just 2k bullets, what's the probability a bullet survives amongst those 2k, but they don't all annihilate each other. And that actually is answered, I believe. And yeah, and the answer is not published. It, it's answered, but there's no proof it's available. The proof, yeah. the proof was written here on the board by Nazarov at some point. Oh, <laughs> and otherwise doesn't exist. Yeah, and, but that's for the finite case. So that 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 doesn't come close to address, or that doesn't address the infinite case in any way that I can see. got the exact formula for the chance that 2k annihilated. Yeah, that if you fire with, with uniform 0, 1 speeds, you fire an even number of bullets that nothing survives. That, that probability is known exactly. And that it's very it's, clean. It's true for any So, so we sort of have this dearth of published results. Or very, there's a shortage of anything that's really known about this. And just recently, we posted, um, I should say I did this with Brittany Diger, Christoph Kinzel, Annie Raymond, Derek Slipkin, and Jennifer Zhu. Fairly large list of people that we accumulated over time, like working on this. And what we study is a variant where instead of uniform 0, 1 speeds, the speeds are discrete. And essentially, we're able to show that there is a phase transition for any discrete bullet outlay where we're choosing uniformly. So suppose that the SI are taken from some set xn, xn minus 1, x1 that's strictly increasing. So x1 is the fastest bullet, xn is the slowest bullet, and uniformly. So I'll just, I'll just do it in a graphic format. So we've got xn, this is the speed of the first bullet, x1, x2. So essentially, or the first thing to note is survival of the first bullet if it has the fastest speed in this variant is a trivial question. If, if your first bullet is the fastest, because it has a one second head start, nothing can catch it. So it's not interesting, but we do see survival if it has speed x1. And our contribution is that it's a non-trivial question to ask if it has the second fastest speed, does it survive? Because now you're depending on some sort of interference behind it preventing fast bullets from catching it. So we can show that this bullet survives. And actually, as a corollary of this that I hope I'll have time to show, we can deduce that. By survive, you mean probability 1? Um, positive, probability. positive probability. Positive probability, positive probability. Okay. yeah. Because with probability a third, it will get annihilated. And, or, in, in, uh, so, yeah. or the second, the bullet right behind it is, is, fa is faster than yeah. it will get annihilated, it's most likely. Large enough n? This theorem? Yeah. This is for, oh, sorry, this is for any n greater than or equal to 3. So what the, the proof I'll present is with speeds 1, 2, and 3. That's sort of the example to keep in mind. And as a corollary of the survival of the second fastest bullet, we can actually prove that the slowest bullet perishes. So what this tells us is that there's some some survival regime and some perishing regime. 
Is it nice the difference of the bulk of the state and the bulk of the volume? That, so that the main open question we have is, can you get to you know the 90th percentile bullet or something? Or, because then possibly you could take that and interpolate to this continuous problem. So this is the first step. It's like the smallest step you could take. But it, and I actually will be able to present basically the whole proof. It's an elementary proof. And why, sorry, I'm confused. Why do you need the x2? You said to prove survival for x2. Why do we want, why do we need to prove survival of x2? I mean, it's a, it's the conjecture, a, you don't need it. Do Wait, the conjecture is about it? to continue, so. So, uh, okay, yeah, the, yeah. so, so what he's saying for discrete, it's trivial that x1 can survive, and he wants to prove something non-trivial, so you prove x2. Yeah, so x2 survives. And yeah, we, we prove a few other things, and this in slightly more generality, but this is this is the main thing that I want to talk about, and just get give a sense of the proof. Like that, that's what I'm here to do. So before I present the actual proof, I want to do a warm-up argument that we pretty closely mirror. And it's of a you know, elementary fact that if you do a biased random walk on Z, the probability it returns to the origin, or the probability it escapes to infinity is positive. And essentially what, what we're going to do is let's take, let's start a walk at 1 and give it a P drift this way, 1 minus P this way with P greater than a half. And I'll define gamma is the return time to 0. So we know that gamma is, positive, is infinity with positive probability. And one way to prove this is through a recursive distributional equation. Matt, let me make a suggestion that you can actually, with this audience, speed up and, and, uh, and actually tell us the real proof as opposed to this. Skip this. Let me, write, let me just write one line. You can do it, but speedily so that you have time for the real thing. OK. No, this is, this is like one line. So what you can do is you can write gamma. But no, I appreciate the suggestion. You can write gamma as an indicator that it moves to 0 initially, plus an indicator that it moves to 2, plus two independent copies of gamma just because you have a renewal if you move one to the right. And what we want to do is try to force, and then you can analyze this in various ways and prove that gamma is infinite with positive probability. And what we want to do is obtain something similar in this discrete bullet problem. Sorry, what, sorry, um, <laughs> <laughs> what is this gamma one plus gamma two? So if, if the walk steps. Is there a half there? Or, or oh, plus one or something. There's a plus one, actually. <laughs> but, um, yeah, just in, in one sentence, the idea is if, if the walker steps to here, mm -hmm. then its return to zero is going to take two independent copies of gamma. And what, what's sort of trivial with random walk is this renewal that goes on as you take that one step. And there's something present like that in the discrete bullet problem, but it takes a little more unearthing to get at. So back to the bullet problem. And I just want to look at the case where SI is taken from the speeds 1, 2, and 3. So I want to make two observations. The first that is that if um, if a speed three catches another bullet, then the bullets after it are independent. With the same distribution as before.
So just imagine that we have a speed three bullet catching a speed two. This event, because these bullets play no role in this event happening, we know that the bullets following it have the same distribution as before. Plausible? Yeah, three is the smallest. Three is the smallest two. Three is the fastest speed. So. so so we'll assume that, yes, yeah, so the three is our x1. Three three, these are the actual speeds. So speed three is the fastest. Yeah. Yeah, there's a bit of an inversion, I guess, with the xn. Yeah. So literally, it has speed three. It's moving at velocity three units per second. So is this? No, what is the state? What is the statement? If the statement is that if on the bullet speeds, if you take the event that the jth bullet why do you need the if? Condition, the same condition of the event that the, three, the, the j bullet kills the i bullet, mm -hmm. maximum speed. Mm -hmm. right? That's what you need. Condition on that event, the random variables for s, for the bullets behind it are independent of that event. Yeah, the if is not the best way to formulate that. The, these speeds are independent of that event. Conditioning on that does not influence their distribution. So this happens if a speed 3 catches a speed 2. And there's another type of capturing that can happen where a speed 2 catches a speed 1. And that's a bit more subtle. Possibly I can just draw the, draw the picture. But let's, let's look at the event that bj catches bi and sj is equal to 2. So necessarily, it's going to catch a speed 1 bullet. And the claim is that there exists some window behind it where there is dependence. And then after that window, we have IID distributions again. The, the intuition being that or the size of this window is exactly such that if this was a speed 3 bullet, it would not catch the speed 2 bullet. You can also say that the guys in front of the 1 are independent of this event, right? Um, yeah, so things in front of 1s have nothing to do with what happens to the speed 1 bullet. But what we'll care about is the you know, infinitely many bullets chasing it. So. so no, but two capturing a one, then? So if, if you have this event of two capturing a one, then there exists some number A, such that the speeds, so say this is BJ, this is BI, and this is BJ plus A. There exists A such that um, S, J plus A plus K, Go back to being IID. And what is this A or what's the depend on? It's A is a function of J and I. So how, how you how you calculate A or so what could go wrong with two if a two is catching this one, what that tells us is there can't be any surviving threes in this window. Once we get far enough out where if this bullet were a speed three, it couldn't catch the speed two, then this event occurring has nothing to do with that so speed. Isn't that just the same as i minus j? Um, I think that with the delays in the firing, it's it's slightly different than that. It's it's some it's some function, some constant times i minus j. No. It doesn't depend on the bullets which are in between b j plus a and no. b j. No, but you want the uniform bound. What? Oh, if you want the uniform bound, I yeah. see. Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah, there is. There must be. The, the, I said A was a, like the tightest. I mean the best. I minus J would be. Yeah, well there it could be explicitly calculated if you know the speeds and you know this what the size of this gap is. But there so there is some some distance where they start being independent again. I I, I think it might Yeah, the two and the the two will, if, if, the, you know, if this i minus j is whatever, 10, then the two will catch the one in 10 steps. Yeah, it's advancing at one. And, and, and then any th a three in order to catch this two, it shouldn't be uh, more than 10 steps away. 
Okay, yeah, that sounds, sounds convincing enough. But, um, except, uh, yeah, I mean, when we do this. Like two, so the one that two annihilates, is it necessarily the one just before two or the one? No, no, no. So then the number of times is it's not just j, right? Because one could have been fired much earlier. No, no, I minus j is we, this. Is so we know, we know that this bullet catches that. But, but this is, I, or, to me, this is, it's a small point, though, the size of this, yeah. right? So, yeah. uh, sorry, we don't want to delay. We yeah. want to get to the, to the meat. Yeah, and that, that's the next proposition. So are these two renewal properties clear? Yes. So we get this independence as we go back further. So the meat is the following proposition that's going to mirror this equation that I wrote right here. So let tau 1 up to tau 5 be distributed like tau, iid. And we'll let x epsilon be uh, also independent of everything for newly epsilon random variable with some epsilon that's to be determined. Oh, well, I guess. Yeah, this is fine. So then the claim is that there exists. So there are five those? Yeah, we're going to use five independent copies of this. Where, uh, reminder, tau is the index of the bullet that annihilates the first bullet. Yeah, so let me. And it's actually slightly different, so let me write it. So tau is such that b tau annihilates b1. So it's the index that annihilates it. And this is conditioned that it has speed 2. So we're looking at that specific case of a speed 2 bullet. So then there exists some epsilon greater than 0. So tau is going to stochastically dominate. Basically, what we'll do is we'll condition on what speed the second bullet has and see the outcome in each of those cases. Oh, thank you. So we're conditioning on the three possible values the second bullet can have. And in this last one, the most is happening. We get x epsilon tau 3 plus tau 4. So. Basically, the proof is going to follow from showing that this equation holds. And then we can do an analysis that is somewhat similar to what happens with the simple random walk, but is also partly inspired by some work we've done on the frog model in the past. And so if this, one thing I just want to observe, if this 2 equals 3, mm -hmm. then the index tau will be 2. two. Yeah. But, this, but on the right-hand side, you just get a 1 here? Um, so, I throw out a lot of the extra terms and just use a stochastic dominance relationship. So I'll, I'll throw out a bunch of kind of noisy terms that don't contribute much. But yeah, so I'll just go one, one, one by one through these three expressions yeah, and say the where they come from. Just multiply by two. And it would still be true, yes. Yeah. But then it would, it would have made a calculation slightly worse in the, when we actually have to analyze this equation is why we drop it. So you've all hit on why the, the first line is true of that. It's um, if you're followed by a speed 3 bullet, then there's no saving a speed 2 bullet. So if then tau is deterministically 2, which is stochastically larger than 1, is all we're saying there.
So let's look at the case S2 equals 2. Maybe you can work out why that's true looking at it. But a picture sort of helps. It's that, so we're going to use that first renewal lemma. The picture is essentially we have B1 has speed 2 and B2 has speed 2. So whatever bullet is going to annihilate this, that's going to take a tau distributed amount of time. So the size of this gap is going to be tau 1. Nothing changed. And what is really nice about having discrete speeds in a second fastest speed is we know the speed of this bullet. This is a speed 3. And so what that tells us is that these are now IID. And if anything, this gap, well, actually because of how this works out, now the time for a bullet to catch this is another copy of tau. Yeah, see. Um, interestingly, it's not any bigger because um, it's, a, it's the fastest. So like having this, having this gap doesn't actually help it. Not the time, it's the index. Ah, I see. Okay, yes. It's, it's the index, yes, yes. yeah. So the time is larger, but the index is yeah. the same. So this is this is why we work with indices. Also, it makes this a little cleaner to talk about. Okay, so in this case, we pick up two copies of tau, and that that's super valuable for when we actually want to work with this equation because you're just doubling the time. But what pushes us over into having this positive probability of survival is this last event. And how this works out is like actually quite nice, I think. So let me, let me try to do it justice. So x epsilon is a Bernoulli random variable. To be determined. To be determined, yeah, which, I, which will take me. You might jump to conclusions about what it is before I actually get to it. What are you telling? The bias? Or the, the value epsilon. The value epsilon. But it's an independent value. It, so all of those random variables are independent of each other. And let me just try to show you what's going on. So we just use this, this was by the first, the first lemma. So now we want to make use of the second renewal lemma. Because the picture is going to look like that a bit. So in this situation, we're followed by a speed one bullet. So at some point, there's going to be a bullet B gamma that annihilates this. So there's, now there's two possibilities. Where here it had to be a speed three. It could be a speed, speed three or a speed two bullet that catches it. Um, in the case that it's a speed three, then what we're going to do is, by the first renewal, we'll have IID bullets behind it. And this is going to survive tau plus gamma more steps. So that doesn't give us a doubling up effect. I'm going to lump that into the 1 minus x epsilon part of that term. But you're no worse off. If you're followed by a 1 and it's caught by a 3, the 2 is going to survive at least a tau a number of times. So fine. So the actual event that we're interested in is if B gamma has speed 2. So what this does is it throws us in the situation of that second lemma that I wrote down. We have a 2 catching a speed 1. So there's some window, which I'll call i, where there is dependence. And behind this window, we have iid bullets again. So. I, something I didn't write down, but I, I said about i, is that if you run a bullet process on just i, Actually, we don't stick the right. oh, is that too low? Thanks. So if we if we restrict to just i. And remember, this is, this is on this event that B gamma is catching B2 and S gamma equals 2. So in order for this bullet to catch the speed 1, necessarily there can't be in this interval if we just let it run. Like by, what I mean let it run is ignore all other bullets. Just let these bullets do their terminating that they would do. There can't be a surviving 3. 
Because this interval is picked exactly such that if there were surviving three, you would catch this. So what that tells us then is that what's left in this gap is only going to be speed two and speed one bullets. So what I'm going to let epsilon be that we only have speed twos after running this. And you can you can work this out and show that it's positive. Like condition on gamma equals five or something. You can you can actually just explicitly show that this is something that can happen. And maybe you can just see this is positive probability. So I'm sort of dealing with a lot of contingencies, but let me just address this first. So if this occurs, we have um, the speed two bullet, this positive interval. Then what we're left with is only speed two bullets in here, you know, some number of them, and IID bullets behind it. Hence, we can at least deduce that we're going to get two more copies of tau. So on this event, x epsilon, or on the occurrence of that event, we pick up these two copies. Possibly more, but we just need these two. And I, I should say that what if it's just surviving ones inside here? And if that occurs, that just throws us back into the original situation we were in. Except now there's just more noise in between the first bullet that started. And so you can repeat this argument until you get repeated twos. Why do you pick two? Why two? Why do we want the twos? There are only twos in there. Now why do you pick oh. three newcomers? Oh, so then we, then we go back to this picture. And we use the fact that if you're followed by a two, so if if you run this, then what this looks like basically is these, all these bullets are gone. There's nothing here. There's a two, and then there's a bunch of twos behind it. So it looks like this picture. I think the second guess, I didn't understand why that tau two was exactly the same, not larger. Um, because it's a bigger gap now. It's, it's a bigger a, gap, but it's an index. It's an index. Even the index, 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 index. It's, 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 I can, I can explain it pretty easily. Because it, because it's, it's because the only thing that can catch this is a speed three. So a, a speed three bullet doesn't care if there's a gap of size one or a gap of size a thousand. It's just going to cruise see, and catch it. Okay. So, so it's so using that. Yeah. And so that's the heavy lifting is getting that recursive distributional equation right there. It it does. I, I don't know if you're interested in how we analyze it, but so can you just repeat why when you do when you find a block where they are only speed two? Mm -hmm. so what was the end of the argument? Oh, the end of the argument is, is this. Is, so this event happens. You have a block of speed twos. Now, now essentially, what your picture is is you have this leading speed two. You have some other speed twos, and then you have IID bullets. And so this picture is at least as good as the case S2 equals 2. And can you repeat the event? So what do you want from the bullets inside? So you look at this set of bullets. Mm -hmm. What do you care about? That after... Oh, we look at I? Yeah, yeah. So we, if we restrict to just those bullets and I, we care about that. So let just those bullets, let them run out and do the annihilations. We want to know that after that, there's only twos left. But do you count for annihilations or count from behind while you, like, what, um, in this conditioning? So, I mean, while these are, are annihilating each other, there are maybe parts well, of why it's killed by... There, there maybe are, but they're independent bullet speeds. So like maybe they will annihilate some of these twos, but that's what's going to happen in this picture anyways. Oh, is that independent? So you, if you basically care about what's left off? Yeah, so we, we want to deal with this dependent chunk. Mm -hmm. And the really convenient feature in this model is that this dependent chunk doesn't have threes in it. And there's no surviving threes in this. And so this is why our argument doesn't work for a third fastest bullet. Because then inside of here you get some problematic pieces. And um, 
So I could say something about how we analyze it, but maybe with, I, I think in four minutes I can say, or are there any questions about this? I think probably the most interesting thing is um, why the perishing bullet is a corollary of it. And I can give like a very quick argument of that. Why, what? Oh, so there's two things we prove. We show that, so I'm claiming this basically establishes survival if you then analyze that equation correctly. And I'm claiming that the perishing slowest bullet is a corollary of it for any number of speeds. But, um, what does it mean perish with probability one? With probability one, it gets caught. So in this picture, a speed, a speed one bullet is annihilated almost surely, whereas a speed two survives with positive probability. Um, can, I, can I present it in sure, sure. just a second? Oh, okay. So the idea for perishing is, well, I'm going to jump back into, it's kind of gets unclear if you just have three speeds. So let's look at the end speed case once more. And what you can do is you can represent the bullet process actually graphically and have the bullets not have delays. So if you think of the position of the bullet fired initially, let's say that it was the slowest bullet, so it's going to have. There's, there's a way to take the bullet process and make it into an equivalent graphical process on the positive integers, where just each point you draw a line. And if two lines cross, then those bullets annihilated. You don't, these don't quite have the same slope as that. There's some transformation, but you can do this. And what we'll, show, what we'll suppose is that this has speed xn. And suppose that the probability that an xn survives equals p positive. So this is to show a contradiction. So what we want to do is use um, an ergodic theorem to say that this can't happen. And what we'll do is show that this, this assumption implies that the second slowest bullet also survives with positive probability. And that can't happen in this picture because then they would have to meet at some point. And to make that a little more careful, if we, the asymmetry of this is a little troublesome. So let's fill in the entire line with the same process. So assign slopes to every single point with the same distribution as these. Both to the right and the left. Yeah, both to the right and the left now. So what's kind of what's kind of cool about this is in the picture from the right, with probability p, nothing is going to hit this first bullet here. We'll put it. So this is our assumption. This is our slowest bullet. And when you reverse this, the slowest bullet actually becomes the fastest bullet. So with probability one, actually nothing is going to annihilate it from the left side. Is that plausible? So the, the, the slopes are the, if you take the speeds, you can transform it into this picture with slopes. So the, the slowest bullet is going to have the smallest slope. It's going to have the most, I mean, I could have drawn it much more extreme. It's going to look like, like this. And faster bullets are more upright. So colliding is going to be then hitting like this. But the picture from the left side is this is actually uncatchable by the other bullets. So it's the fastest. Do you stop drawing when two lines collide? Or? Yeah, then you take them out. So okay. that, that's how you track. You just look at the first collision, and that's when they annihilated, or who annihilated who. So. So the first thing you saw in the I think this was. I mean, we knew a long time ago that if you have the two-sided thing with any distribution, mm -hmm. then uh, so so that is you start not just uh, infinitely into the past but infinitely into the future. Yes. Then then uh, slowest then, survive. Then uh, not just the slowest, but then the probability that a bullet survives is, is zero. Um. So so that's that's just straightforward from ergodic. No, I think you, you possibly could have one surviving bullet. I think. I think that. So if you had, 
if, if you have a two-sided picture, it's all stationary. So if you have positive probability of survival, yeah. then you have positive density of survivors. The, and um, a, a priori, that's possible, though, I think. I see. With, so with continuous speeds, of course, that's impossible. Yeah, but, but right, with, the, the picture is like the speeds 0, 1, and minus 1. So it's like it's not clear if zero survives. You can show that. But with uh, discrete speed, so if you had a survivor, then you have positive density. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So you can't have two survivors. You have two different speed survivors. Yes, things, but uh, you can have, have infinitely many positive density at the same, all at the same speed. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so that you just not you can just not at the slowest speed because that by reversing that's well, it's a little there's still a bit more to say about this. And this is one sided also, so it's not when we do the bullet process it's one sided, so we don't have the two sidedness going on. But when you have the slowest speed if you change it to the two sided it's it's the same because the right hand guys can't can't, can't catch it, can't yeah. Catch. So for the slowest mm -hmm. speed, it's equivalent. Yeah, so, so it's, it's enough to show that this is going to perish in this two-sided model. And it's, it's one line to get there from here. Okay. And so we know that the probability that the second, the second slowest bullet survives has to be greater than or equal to p. So this is, this is let's say that this bullet in red right here has speed x xn minus 1, then we know that the probability something gets it from this side is, is at least, or that nothing gets it from this side is at least p. This is just, this is the monotonicity in the bullet problem. Fire a faster bullet, it has at least as good of a chance of surviving. And where we actually get this as a corollary of our second fastest bullet surviving, is when we start asking about the survival of xn minus 1 from this side, the picture now in this flipped model is this is the second fastest bullet. So our theorem implies that the probability nothing hits it from this side is at least some epsilon. So I guess, I mean, the picture is this is from the right, this is from the right, and the probability that from the left is some q greater than zero, let's say. So now with this, and this is what you've always just observing, is we know that this picture isn't beautiful, but any, any site that has speed xn survives with positive probability, probability p, in fact. And any site with speed xn minus 1 survives with probability at least p times q. And so now we have two surviving speeds, and that's going to, by ergodic theorem, say there's a dense set of them. And so they, that's a contradiction because they'd have to meet. So, um, yeah, and essentially the problem we'd like to look at is showing that the third fastest or the epsilon and fastest survives. Trying to get something like that. Epsilon maybe would be quite dramatic. Or one minus epsilon and or something yeah. that survives, yeah. But that would be quite dramatic from what this argument is doing. Any other questions? For epsilon, or one minus epsilon, then you cannot even do n minus two, right? No. Yeah. So we want n minus or x three, I guess, is what we want next. Did you check uh, numerically for for speeds? If, uh, uh, what what the speed can, uh, what the speed two does? Yeah. Um, no, no, we haven't looked at that. Four speeds is weird. It's, I think of like a hundred speeds and the ninety eight basically is what I've looked at. But not numerically anything. Yeah, that should be too hard to simulate. Yeah. Okay. Yeah,